Hello and welcome to the series finale of Starting Points. I am your host, Jay Brenneman, bringing you the voices of change in your communities and our region. Joining me today is Jason Lavery, Selena King, Katie Morton, and Adam Williams. Thank you for joining us. Jason, you are the president of Lavery Brewing Company in Erie, uh, the city of Erie, which is, uh, but your, your brand is, is regional and, and uh, extends quite out some distance. My favorite uh, beer, I don't know about everybody else, I'm not saying that just because you're here, but uh, it's good to have that asset in the community. Thank you. Um, Selena King, you are the director, the development director for Larsh Erie. Yes. Uh, Katie Morton is an AmeriCorps Vista who uh, does her work in the city of Erie on the east side, and Adam Williams is a, self, is a practicing attorney at law. Um, one of the big things that our community faces is that we have uh, stagnant population growth. The constant questions that come up are, what do we do about uh, retaining uh, our educated youth? How do we educate our youth? How do we build a strong workforce? Um, how do we build our economy? We look at uh, communities across the country, and they're facing losses significantly. Um, we're not suffering so much um, in broader aspects. In some specific areas, our communities are hard hit. But, the, but when you look at the overall picture, we're, we're pretty stagnant. Nothing really is happening. Nothing exciting is happening. Nothing big is really happening, or nothing has really found traction. Um, what I would like us to, to talk about today is really where are we now, and how do we move beyond that? How do we solve the, the problems of, of, uh, of our region? Um, recently, uh, Destination Erie, they had the culmination of a, a multi-year effort um, where they took community participants focused on uh, who we are as a region and what we need to do uh, to be a more effective, uh, growing, thriving community. Um, from that was the Emerge 2040 report, and now we'll be moving on the stage of uh, hopefully or potentially implementing some of the findings that they had uh, talked about. But let's get started with perhaps uh, one of the, the big discussions uh, that people talk about is maybe a, they, they look at it as a, as a solution or how do we tackle. Every time the discussion of how we're doing as a region comes up, we talk about population growth. What roles do you think population growth has in, uh, as a metric for how we're doing? I think it's huge. I mean, I think uh, the city hasn't grown since 1980 in size. I think the uh, how we have a lot of these communities that are on the peripheral of the city, you know, so a lot of uh, the urban center is moving to these peripheral communities, which uh, makes us a smaller city in the state's eyes, which, which I think affects our funding as well. So uh, I know some of our leaders in the past have talked about uh, unification of some of the, the smaller surrounding areas like Wesleyville, <coughs> which essentially I view as part of the city of Erie. I mean, I don't know why it's considered its own city, but, you know, some forward thinking ideas like that might actually help our city. And, and Jason, you brought up some key points as far as um, stagnant growth in the city, and that does affect grant, and grant programs from the state. Uh, we are uh, in many ways relying upon the federal government or the state government to save us. So when we have problems in our community, it's like, well, in order to solve this, we need to get a grant or something that aspect from the state or the federal government to help deliver us to the light. Um, is that really where, it, and we've been doing it for, for decades, and like you said, we haven't seen much growth since the 80s. Is, is that the wrong path? Is there still something to that? Well, I, I think to, to echo a little bit what, what Jason said, it's not just the quantity of people. You can look at, the, at population numbers and see how those change or don't change or increase or decrease over time, but it's also the, the quality, right? So we've got several fine institutions in our region. We're drawing all kinds of qualified high school graduates to those institutions, and then after graduation, they bail and, and go somewhere else. So I, I, I think that the, the numbers are important, but also the, the uh, I, to use the term again, the quality of the people that are coming in and maybe not staying um, is, is affecting it quite a bit. So uh, to answer your question, are grants the solution? No. Um, there's got to be some other draw to keep, to keep you know, better, better quality um, people, you know, to keep our population growing. So the, the, the skilled workforce, the, uh, the entrepreneurs, the uh, thought leaders, the idea makers, um, both young or old, how do we retain them? They're coming into our communities, we're educating them, but then they're fleeing or they're leaving. Uh, the term brain drain is often used in that sense. 
Um, some of our own uh, youth are doing the same thing. They graduate and they move on. Um, but also drilling down, as Adam was kind of pointing to, drilling down into some of the populations, uh, Erie has been holding strong because we are one of the resettlement uh, areas in the country for refugee populations. Historically, uh, be it the Polish, Italian, German populations, we have been a center point for refugees to come in. They started their businesses, they grew their families, uh, they did well, then they moved on into the inner ring suburbs like Jason was saying. Um, but now we're also seeing other uh, migrant, East African, Nepalese, Bhutanese, Bosnian. We're seeing those uh, uh, populations who've come in, settled. Their dollar tends to stay in the community longer. They start small businesses and move on. Um, Katie, you work uh, with uh, some of these populations in, in the areas where they've been resettled. Tell us what you think about some of uh, how that might play into our future or if or how we can uh, uh, drive from that point if we can. Sure. So I work at the Urban Erie Community Development Corporation. We are not a resettlement agency, but we do offer a lot of supportive services to new Americans, refugees and immigrants when they um, arrive. They may have been here for several years. So one of the main things that I see Erie has to do to move forward is to invest in this population, invest in the human capital of new Americans through providing um, English as a second language classes job preparation and employment training, um, helping the, the children acculturate and the youth acculturate into the United States better um, because they have offset our population decline. Um, we have thousands of new Americans who are in the community and in order for them to be productive citizens and to, to contribute to our society, we need to be making um, measured impacts measured uh, human capital investments in this community or else um, they won't be moving us forward in the way that we may want them to. So they're coming with a, a desire. They, they, they come to right. Erie. It might be a little right. bit better than they, they've seen in their own oh, yeah. countries. There's still the struggles that they go through. Um, the, the, the drastic change in whether it's climate or culture, mm -hmm. uh, economic uh, practices. and um, But also uh, there's some of those things where uh, focusing on, on soft skills such as language, such as um, mm -hmm. uh, dress, but also where do they get the resources to do a lot of this? Often where we think of refugee or migrant populations relying upon uh, the government uh, sources for income for some of these things, when in reality it's, mm -hmm. it's quite the opposite. Right. Um, Selena, as far as, you know, and, and are nonprofits really the, the answer? What do you see as far as when we look at refugee and migrant populations, um, what role do, do you think that nonprofits or, or government sector or private sector has in helping them realize their uh, dreams familial and economically? Um, but wh where does that play? Who's, who does that? Where does that begin? Um, I really think the nonprofit sector has a great opportunity um, to fill that gap. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily a, the government's job to do that. Um, as we talked about with the funding, you know, that we're always looking for the government to do that. Um, this is not the job of the government to teach soft skills. Um, typically, you know, for us, we've been fortunate that was something we learned in our homes. Um, so the, where this gap um, is that the nonprofit organizations can come in, as well as those, you know, um, in the church population. I know sometimes the religious sector does that as well, and even educationally. Um, in those areas where you have the colleges and universities and the partnerships that have come about. Um, I know things with Erie Gaines, they have done great things in their communities um, and have partnered with different organizations to go about and teach soft skills in different organizations that don't have them. Um, but it's a matter of making sure that people know the opportunities are there, making sure that where there are opportunities that we can try to grow them and then see where the needs are. Um, a lot of times these groups aren't really being talked to. We don't really know where the needs are. And so really a lot of it is really communication. So until we can, can learn to communicate better and bring more people to the table together, then we can um, more address that need. So that you, you pointed to a couple good things. We're, we're talking about how, uh, the how the government may not necessarily be the best uh, um, uh, entity in the role of, of educating or helping the transferring of, of knowledge, acculturation, experience into uh, the new economy, the new uh, a culture, society, but um, so let's say that we have the nonprofit realm step up to that point, and they have in many cases, um, helping them make that transition. Um, at the same time, what kind of connections as far as business, or what kind of you know, if if 
the nonprofits are over here doing something out, out here, but if it's not done in integration and dialogue and discussion with the business owners, are we really being effective? What role do businesses have in doing that? I think a huge role uh, as far as um, <coughs> creating the jobs that you know refugees and immigrants might uh, enjoy. Um, I know a lot of the immigrants come are skilled workers as well. So, a as me as a business owner, you know, I hear a lot about like job creation, and, and obviously that's a huge answer. But it doesn't just happen overnight. So there's a lot of like dominoes that need to fall in order for me to create a job. Um, I wish I could just create a million jobs and then magically pay for them, but um, that's not the reality. So, you know, businesses need. Uh, the appropriate support from government and from the community venues, you know, to grow their businesses, and then also, you know, programs to help them hire workers, uh, train them, things like that. So, and if I can, if I can piggyback off of that, I, I think it's not just that we can we can help uh, the immigrant community and, and provide jobs for them. I think the most valuable thing that they bring to our community is they, they're coming to the United States and they still see the American dream. So a lot of these people come and start their own businesses, mm -hmm. create their own jobs, help their own communities. And believe it or not, as an attorney, I'm a for-profit and I've benefited from this because the, these folks will come to me and ask for advice on, on how, to, how to start a business and how to create these jobs. And, and that, I, I think, is invaluable, especially in an area where we tend to rely on our largest employers and, and their stability and who's going to provide the jobs. When we have these people coming in with a completely outside perspective and saying, we're going to be the ones to create these jobs. And they're, they're, so it's not just, it's not just the, the, the cultural benefit that they bring and the, and the, uh, you know, the world experience that they have, but they've, they've, they've still got the passion for the American dream, which, which is, like I said, incredibly valuable. And so Big Brother or big corporations, um, you know, we, we look to them as, as because that's, they tend to have a lot more resources and they're the big players when it comes to sponsoring and supporting things like that. Um, but uh, often, uh, you know, some of the, the largest growth in jobs happens at the low and middle level uh, employers. All, all net new job creation comes from businesses five, year olds, five, five years old or newer. And that, that's an amazing statistic because... I just um, made it up. So. Well, that's okay. well, it's amazing that you did that. Um, like, kudos. Uh, so um, so you know, if, if that's where that exists, then should our focus also be on um, sustaining or helping those, those businesses at that age um, and, and being successful? I mean, is, should it be the, the job description? Often when, when government, and, and as, a, as a government official, and I see this, that... Um, one of the first responses that political leaders have when we try to when we talk about bringing in new jobs we're like if we can do a tax incentive and get a big corporation to move in here and employ hundreds or thousands of people our problems are solved but if the majority of the and, and as, as hard as that is because that means another region is going to lose out on hundreds or thousands of jobs and are they just going to leave us at some point mm -hmm. but if the largest net job growth is happening with these younger and smaller size companies then what kind of incentives can we give these companies in order to do well, in order to employ these? Well, I mean, we are one of those companies. We're five years old as of February of this year. And I would love, I mean, we have, you know, I mean, to go back a second, you know, how does a young business create new jobs? And if, for us, at least, and uh, my friends that also own businesses, I know it comes down to capital and cash flow and things like that. We could easily build another brewery right now to fulfill the need we have for our beers that we can't supply. For my own house. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, so it comes down to, you know, who's going to who's going to loan us the money at an interest rate? Are we going to be able to find qualified brewers, which we could from outside of the region obviously, but you know, you know, the job program would be able to help that as well, but mostly it comes down to money and, you know, access to money. EGRA was huge for us. Um, we got a, a conventional business uh, business loan through a bank, and then um, we got the EDCEC piggy banked on our uh, collateral to give us another loan. So that was huge. So uh, low collateral uh, loans and a lot of this was local money that was coming back. Yeah, anyway. Jason, thank you, everyone. We're going to take a break right now. We'll be back after these messages. I got no pulse, so goes and shock him, tries to run all the time. Just had a few drinks. This can't be happening. Are we clear? Clear. We just buzzed. Just buzzed? You didn't tell us that, sir. You're right, this isn't happening. He'll be fine. Yeah, I feel good. Really? No, not really. Buzz driving. Maybe we should stop acting like it's no big deal. Shock him.
<laughs> this can't be happening. This can't be happening. Of course it's not happening. Armored car. <laughs> Listen, having money isn't about luck. Make your own coffee, save a thousand bucks a year. Feed me. Feed the pig. up on sex don't give up on birth control either there are more methods than you think find yours at bedsider.org welcome back to starting points our panel today jason lavery president of lavery brewing company selena king development director uh, director of development for Larch erie katie morton americorps vista and adam williams who's a practicing attorney of law uh, before we went to break, we were discussing the integrating, particularly the, the minority and refugee and uh, uh, populations and getting them to, uh, linked up with uh, small businesses because that tends to be where the, the, the real job growth is at. Um, so when it comes to uh, making those connections between the nonprofits and the businesses and government, what, who plays what role and, and where do we go from there? Well, part of this show was called starting points and it was to bring people together who I think mostly don't talk on a regular basis um, so that we can have dialogue and not just have dialogue but actually put feet to what we are talking about and so because even just the four of us are here and then the veins that we work in I believe that a lot of work can be done um, just by us doing what Jason talked about with the business loans that you know as a business owner it's a new idea that probably a lot of people haven't thought about um, Adam brings a lot of business law um, experience and then Katie having a resettlement and myself with the nonprofit um, background. So if we brought those things together and then came to, you know, what you do in your governmental roles, um, I think a lot of things that people haven't discovered, you know, with us being in that under 40 realm, um, could do a lot of work for this next generation and what we're looking for Erie to do because this is the group that we're talking about, that we always talk about where is the brain drain, where are we going. If people see more of us out in the forefront leading the way, I believe that that does will do as a huge service to Erie. It will help us um, actually move forward and get more work done. You know, you, you bring up the, uh, generationally, uh, population-wise, uh, those who would be considered uh, in or on the ed edge of the millennial generations, uh, whether or not you like that term, um, uh, is the, the largest growing uh, population soon to, and if not already, superseding the size of the baby boomer population. And they love craft beer. And they love <laughs> craft beer. And they don't like lawyers, though. And they don't, still don't like lawyers. They don't know what's happening with this. But, and so we're, we're, we're seeing this, uh, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, and going in, and I want to talk a little bit more about where um, the roles of government and everything, but intermixed into that is that, um, yeah, maybe we ha when we try new things, sometimes it takes a new generation or, or uh, a new, uh, new realm of leaders in, in, in all the realms and all the sectors that involves um, to make that shift. Um, and so where, where does that mix in? When we talk about young professionals graduating from college, opportunities to provide leadership in their community and helping shift the dialogue and the focus away from some of the things that maybe haven't worked too well in the past, or maybe we need to just change things up a little bit, same ingredients, different recipe. What are your thoughts, Katie? Um, well, I can speak as an AmeriCorps Vista. Um, many people I know from my college, my friends and colleagues, they are pursuing service positions. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of people who apply uh, for positions in Teach for America, City Year, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, and this is a very um, popular choice for young graduates to... And why do you think that is? Um, I think that it provides them with 
uh, hard skills, applicable job skills that they might not find in a traditional entry-level position. And so if we were to capitalize upon that, that desire and that passion for social change, I think we could do a whole lot because there are people who are looking for that gap year after college who are looking to make an impact who might not know what they want to get into and having a year of service or two years of service after they graduate gives them that perspective and that clarity. Um, so I think there is a lot of potential to move uh, service forward for young people. There are lots of people who apply for AmeriCorps positions and do not receive them. It's very, it is very competitive. Peace Corps is very competitive. Um, all of those programs are. Um, so if we were to, to galvanize that movement, I think that we could really spark some social change because the young people want it and they have the vision and they have the ideas. They just need more opportunities to do that. Because it's not easy. It's, it's tough. It's hard work. It takes place over the course of a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not necessarily a new idea. Germany and their culture has been doing it for a while where they go off for a year or two, mostly unpaid. I don't know if that would work too well um, here, but even without stipends. But um, you know, when we look at the opportunity, when, when you give somebody a sense of purpose, a place, a challenge in the communities that they may be originally from or maybe not, you give them that opportunity to. And so, yeah, does that help? It helps them when they're, if they become the, the future job uh, owners, if they become the future managers, if they become the future professionals or public or private leaders. Um, how do we, and what, where do we mix, how do we inv increase that opportunity? You know, again, some of those are federal programs. Right. How do we do that as a region and say, look, we need a sense of purpose uh, for our young, uh, young people, um, college level or before college. How do we give them that sense of purpose in a way that's going to connect uh, changing the uh, economy and the, uh, the growth of our, of our region? I think the, the millennials, I don't think you need to convince them that social justice is a good thing. I, I think it's in, I'm going to say, in a lot of them, in a lot of us, okay? You don't uh, want to be among us. I, You're yeah, one I of us. I, I'm, I, am, I am a mercenary, and all I want to do is make money. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. But I, I, I think you, you need to, to allow that, that desire that, that these kids would have and allow that to blossom. And I, I think programs like, like AmeriCorps or the Peace Corps or, or or uh, whatever other federal programs are good, I think you can also do it in the for-profit realm too. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you can convince people that not only can they, can they do good, but they can do well at the same time, I, I think that's hugely important. And, and if you can do that coming out of college or coming out of high school, you know, you don't need the four-year degree. If you can convince more people to take the risk, which it is risky to, to go out and start a business, I mean, Jason's done it going on five years, that's, that's outstanding, but he's, he's done programs, he's done events at the brewery where they benefit a charity with what they do. He's not making money, it's taken his staff, it's taken his building, it's taken his beer to, to do it, but they're, they're finding a way to do good at the same time. And I, I think, I, I, not only is it an opportunity to teach younger people about that, it's also a business opportunity because if I'm doing something and I'm doing it for the right reasons, I think that's going to make me a lot more successful long term as a, as a business person. Because it's, it's branding in a sense, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I was in AmeriCorps in, uh, when I was working my way through college. I did AmeriCorps two terms. Um, so yeah, I think I've, you know, what we said earlier, what I believe about like, you know, government helping businesses grow, I think ultimately it comes back to the responsibility of the individual. And maybe that's why the refugees have such a, such a good record of starting businesses because it takes so much gusto to start a business. So ultimately we can, you know, go back to the, to the government and things like that, creating jobs, but ultimately it's going to be the millennials and uh, I don't think I'm a millennial. I'm 34. Whatever the one before. Yes, you are. Was. But, <laughs> you don't, you don't act like one. So you know, Adam, you brought up the point that look, we don't have to convince uh, millennials, the young folks, so to to get involved and do this. They have this sense of mission, this sense of purpose. They want to, you know, cut their teeth on these things. They, they want the, the challenge. To do it. But they need the venue. So yeah. where do these opportunities open up? That's you know, where government comes that's in. That's where government <laughs> comes in. So, but where does uh, you know when Washington is, is locked up, when Harrisburg is locked up, and we're we're we only have so many uh, openings. We're talking. We have thousands of young people, but there's only a handful of these leadership opportunities coming down from some of these bigger programs. Where does local or regional government come into play? Well, I know I'm uh, speaking, I should answer that, but where, where do you think that local or, or regional government comes into, into that role in order to make these things happen locally using local resources? Me personally, I think um, 
you know, what we talked about earlier, how the city is sprawling out all over the place. If we could find a way to redevelop some of the bu buildings in the city, whether it's through the government or, you know, a nonprofit that buys buildings, renovates them, and then has almost like incubator, incubator space, I know a ton of my friends that would be able to create their little small businesses that aren't necessarily high revenue, but at least they're creating like one or two jobs. You know, they're leaving their old jobs to create a couple new jobs for their own venture. And then you kind of just get a grassroots movement from there where if we have the spaces to grow, I mean, when we moved into our building, we had to spend, you know, six figures to, to renovate it, you know, and, and, and that cost to a, a growing business is huge. So if uh, we were some way, if there was some way to create, you know, spaces for small businesses to start and not have to invest all that kind of money, you might see a lot of businesses So not start. necessarily tax incentives, but... You, you can do that for profit, though. I mean, think yeah. about where you started. You started in another brewery. They yeah. wanted to help you out. Exactly. They were doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and, and look at you now. And, and then you talk about the incubator space. We have that in Erie now. Mm -hmm. um, in the Renaissance Center, the, the Radius just started up there, and they have co-working space. So it's it's low overhead, it's it's low rent, it's low investment, but it's that opportunity. And yeah. it comes back to the individuals. You know. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, government can, can help or hurt that, but Neither of those two examples were, were reliant on any, any federal or local yeah. programs. So does government get out of the way? Do we, no, what do we do? You can still be involved. Um, there's some of our authorities need to be redesigned, and thankfully that's happening. There are opportunities for our younger people to get involved, just for them to step up and say, I want to be involved. Um, as a youngest member of the zoning hearing board, um, it was it something at first I was jumping to do? But no, but it's an opportunity to make a difference every day and to be someone that's making decisions that better the city and know that I am doing it as a younger person that is looking at uh, long-term goals. Um, even with some board memberships that you can do for nonprofits, um, getting involved with Project Blueprint and things like that, and even get connected mm -hmm. through the United Way. There are many, many opportunities. Again, it's being involved, listening to the conversations that are going around, and um, just making sure that we're talking in our organizations and keeping our eyes out to people that we can even mentor. Those are So is government a facilitator to these things? And how does that facilitation take place? When we come to you, just be open to listen to us to talk, you and all your colleagues. That's what we want you to do. <laughs> so we're listening. But you all, what are you asking? I think individual politicians also need to be um, very cognizant and aware and have their pulse on the community. I think there is a disconnect sometimes with politicians in the Erie region from what's happening on the ground. And so having that pulse, being involved, going to community events, talking to the people when they do come to, to uh, forums or when they do come to public meetings, um, following up and taking action on what they're presenting or what they're concerned about. Um, but I do see there there is a disconnect and politicians. And, it, and it's tough. So, you know, yeah. as public officials, you know, uh, often most of ours, my, me included, uh, you know, we have other full-time jobs or we have other things going on. This public service mm -hmm. is a second job that we take on and it's, it's kind of tough. We don't get paid a whole lot, despite what some people might think. But we also have uh, large communities go around. But when you look at those who are running for office, we have out of the 38 municipalities we have in the county, there's so many, there's well over a dozen blank spaces when mm -hmm. it comes to the boroughs mm -hmm. and townships and when it comes to running for or even asking to be on some of these boards, et cetera, it's so small that people don't get involved. How do we get young uh, professionals, young leaders, young people to look at that as an opportunity to serve and to lead and to change things? How do we entice people into doing that? Because they don't want to get paid nothing or very little and have mudsling at them uh, in some sense, and it is a lot of work. So where does, where does that come to play in? I, I, I would step back even further from that. Do you need to convince them to do it? I mean, does does, gov does does any level of government, do they think they need to do too much to help us? You know, and I, I think that may be part of the concern is, and you asked the question earlier, I'll, I'll answer it, my own opinion. Um, when when we're asking you to do things and we want you to listen and you said, what are you, what are you asking us to do? I want you to get out of my way. You know, I, I, I and, and it goes for my clients as well. They have the ideas. It's challenging enough to start a business, so, let me try it. Let me take the risk. Let me fail, potentially. It may happen. Um, but I, I, I think sometimes you do need to get out of the way. So um, now, on the other hand, if, if you think that there's a value that you can add as being a public servant, Jay, you certainly do do this, um, then I, I think that's how you convince people to do it. Because again, we're, we're going back to saying, you can do good, and here's how you can do it. And it's going to be a lot of work, and it's going to be a hassle, but anything that's worthwhile is, is going to have those qualities to it. Adam? Everyone, that's going to have to be the last point. Uh, thank you for joining uh, me on the panel today. 
Uh, folks, thank you for turning, tuning in. Uh, this has been Starting Points. Uh, thank you again, uh, Jason Lavery, Selena King, Katie Morton, Adam Williams, and to you at home, thank you and have a great day.